Carol J. Henry is a professional lecturer at George Washington University School of Public Health and Health Services, Department of Environmental and Occupational Health. At George Washington University, she has expanded her interest to the fields of green chemistry and engineering as a means to reduce the impacts of chemicals on health and the environment. Dr. Henry provided guidance to the Society of Automotive Engineers uh, International for initiating a committee chartered by the SAE's Motor Vehicle Council for developing standards and best practices for green innovation and sustainability in the auto industry. And you're going to hear a lot more about that in today's presentation. But finally, I want to point out that Dr. Henry is also currently an elected counselor of the American Chemical Society, a member and past president of the American Chemical Society of Washington, and a member of the ACS Committee on Environmental Improvement. She is a member of the Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology of the National Resource Council, Research Council, excuse me, the Environmental Health Perspectives Editorial Board, the American College of Toxicology, of which she has been president, the Society of Toxicology, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and the International Sci Society of Exposure Science. So as you can see, she has um, a tremendous amount of experience um, in a variety of fields, which are all coming together for this presentation today, enhancing green innovation and sustainable practices in the automotive sector. Carol, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Lynn, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to make this presentation on behalf of the Society of Automotive Engineers and the Green Technology Steering Committee. So I wasn't sure <clears throat> about the audience, but uh, many people, if you're not an engineer in the automotive sector, you may not know a lot about SAE International. So I thought I would just introduce that a little bit. It's headquartered the <clears throat> in Warrendale, Pennsylvania. I apologize, I may, um, at least I'm speaking today, I had uh, a cold where I thought I was going to lose my voice, so it'll only be a little scratchy now and then, but I apologize for any coughs and wiggles here. So SAE uh, has automotive headquarters in Troy, Michigan, uh, obviously in close proximity to the major auto uh, sector in Michigan. It's a 501c3 not-for-profit global association of 128,000 engineers and related technical experts in the aerospace, automotive, and commercial vehicle industries. It's over 100 years old uh, as, a, as a society. Uh, its purpose is to share information and exchange ideas for advancing engineering and the mobility systems. And if you haven't, aren't familiar with the term mobility systems, I'll refer to that um, <clears throat> several times. It really encompasses everything that moves, um, except railroads. Otherwise, as you'll see, it's, uh, SAE is concerned with uh, standards development, events, technical information, and expertise used in designing, building, maintaining, and operating vehicles for use on land or sea, in air or space. And uh, railroads are the only uh, thing I can think of that they do not cover. So today, <clears throat> I want to give you um, an overview of the presentation uh, that will how we got into some of these issues for green chemistry and engineering and sustainability. SAE has a vision for 2020 that uh, I'll describe for you. Um, many of you may be very familiar with the Michigan Green Chemistry Initiatives, and I wanted to describe what SAE's response to that was. It's really engaged uh, quite a bit. Um, describe the Green Technology Steering Committee, uh, give you some examples of green chemistry projects that really do subscribe to the green chemistry principles in the automotive sector. Talk a little bit about bio-based materials in the auto industry, because I think the auto industry is really in the forefront of the use of such materials, and that may be a surprise to people. Um, it was a surprise to me about the extent that, they're actu that actually bio-based materials are being used. And then <clears throat> SAE's actually had a concept of, a gr of green car factors that might be used um, to, to look at cars in a slightly different way as it relates to sustainable mobility, and then to share some lessons learned and future steps that SAE has learned along the way. So SAE's vision for 2020 <coughs> is 
uh, to be the number one in the mobility industry by connecting a global network of students, engineers, practitioners, and companies, uh, attracting, managing, and distributing mobility-related information through education, standards, and technical publications. SAE has probably over 10,000 standards, and I'm not quite sure how many documents, but it is uh, really quite an amazing uh, collection of technical information that I found that the health and environmental community is probably not so familiar with. Not, not that you need this, this is for engineers, but there really is a, quite a resource here that is important to understand. SAE wants to be leading in global standardization. There are SAE organizations around the world at this stage, including in China and India. And then creating and sustaining beneficial affiliations and interfaces <clears throat> that add value, encourage innovation, and help form sound public policy in the mobility sector. Well, the environmental and green challenges for the mobility industry are quite critical and global. Um, there are concerns about such terms as sustainable mobility and green mobility products. Uh, in the engineering community, they don't like using these because there's no strict definition. So clearly up till now, green initiatives have focused on fuel efficiency, but it's been recognized that it should be more than that. Um, it's difficult. The other thing to keep in mind is you have, there may be new technologies that are useful. It's very difficult to commercialize new auto technologies. Um, EPA has estimated it takes 15 years for a new technology to penetrate. At least that's what's been happening in the past, whether that will continue or not. But that's a long time to get new technologies in place. The other observation is that individual companies are really active in sustainability and the green arena. And the challenge is for the industry to come together in a consensus for a path forward. So SAE's proposed actions for the mobility industry in this context is to provide technical information and feedback to address the issues before regulations are imposed. Um, this is a very regulated industry, and so if there can be progress made in some of these sustainability arenas without regulations, the industry would welcome that. Uh, they would like to make the, the mobility sector part of the solution and to facilitate industry's approach to be more environmentally responsive, yet cost effective and time sensitive. And we'll get back to that issue um, frequently. Uh, the last thing SAE would like is to make sure or assure that the mobility sector is recognized as a leader for new, green, and sustainable technology. So I thought a little background on transportation might be instructive. Um, this information has been drawn from the U.S. Energy Information and the World Resources Institute. Almost 20% of the world's total delivered energy is used in the trans transportation sector. Uh, it accounts for more than 50% of world consumption of liquid fuel. And 14% of greenhouse gases worldwide originate from the transporta transportation sector, making it about the third largest emission source. In the U.S. alone, reflecting our um, very large number of vehicles, uh, transportation is responsible for two-thirds of our petroleum usage, and on-road vehicles re are responsible for about 80% of the transportation petroleum usage. So clearly, um, autos and transportation and on-road vehicles are a very important sector as we look at the future for sustainability. There are trends in the auto industry that recognize uh, some of these issues. Uh, light weighting is a term called uh, that's being used in the, in the industry to find materials that reduce the mass and weight of a vehicle. But one of the points about light weighting is it still, the materials still have to be uh, maintain safety. The safety issues are really paramount. Um, there's a trend toward low and zero emissions, uh, alternative propulsion systems, reduced vehicle energy consumption, and again, weight reduction to improve fuel economy, uh, increased use of renewable and sustainable materials, recyclable materials, reduced waste to landfills, and bio-based materials. These last items we'll talk about a little bit more. Another fact that I think is not well known outside the industry is the extent of recycling. The automobile is one of the most recycled consumer products <laughs> on the face of the planet. Um, in North America, 95% of retired autos are processed for recycling every year. This can kind of compare, now clearly we have to pick our databases, but appliances are recycled at about a rate of 67%, paper at 50%, aluminum cans at 45% and soft drink bottles at 34%. So 
So clearly the automotive industry has figured out recycling. Um, the comment has been, or the observation is that recycling vehicles provides enough steel to produce almost 13 million new autos and save 85 million barrels of oil annually. Uh, these are on products that are expected to last more than 15 years. So with that introduction and a little background, I thought I would then describe how SAE became involved with green chemistry activities in Michigan. Many of you are familiar with the 2006 Michigan Executive Directive by Governor Granholm. Um, subsequently, uh, an action plan was developed for Michigan Green Chemistry Research Development and Education. And in 2009, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, with support from the Michigan Green Chemistry Roundtable, awarded a grant for a workshop to SAE, and that was in 2009. And the title of this was the Feasibility Study for Establishing a Center for Green Innovation and Technology Transfer for the Automotive Industry in Michigan. At the time, there was some thought that if a center were established, that some of these issues of technology transfer and this long lead time that takes for technologies to penetrate into the industry might be reduced. Uh, that still might be the case, but there are clearly a lot of issues around establishing a center, not the least of which was who was going to pay for it. So there were three significant observations from this uh, workshop, and one was that a center could be a means to achieve the goals for green innovation. A second is that other approaches to achieve the goal um, through leveraging other resources or organizations or existing centers uh, would be possible. And third, that a network of interested individuals and practitioners could be established to further explore and refine these issues and concepts. And that is actually what um, SAE has then uh, undertaken in forming the Green Technology Steering Committee uh, with a scope to serve as a guiding body for consensus standards development for environmental sustainability issues in the automotive sector um, with, the, with the sense that meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs so that we really keep the sustainability principles in mind. We've defined a concept within this committee. It's not, been, um, it's not been put into a standard or an official definition, but we certainly are working under this umbrella, which is that the concept of green is related to the size of the environmental footprint of a product, that is, the degree to which a product has a negative impact on human health and ecosystems. At the moment, there are four uh, task forces that are active. One is uh, collecting automotive technology case studies that uh, demonstrate green engineering, um, green, green chemistry and engineering principles, and I'll describe just a couple of those. Uh, a related vehicle materials uh, group that's focusing on some of the bio-based issues. There's a terminology and definitions uh, task force, which ha will be, uh, has, has transformed the title actually into a glossary. I'll describe that in just a little bit. And then there's another uh, group looking at principles and practices of green chemistry and engineering. I should close uh, in describing this, tech, uh, this green technology steering committee to say that the workshop mission statement for these first generation activities, which is how we look at this green technology steering committee, is that the mission is to become a network of green innovation for global automotive, automotive stakeholders. And I think we have, uh, we're, we're definitely on that mission. So the work in progress by this committee, uh, implementation of green chemistry and engineering within the automotive sector. This is a document that's under development. Um, we have the glossary of terms in use in green innovation and sustainable practices in the automotive industry, which is under development. And we are optimistic we'll release that in the summer of uh, 2012. Uh, we maintain an inventory of green chemistry and engineering case studies from EPA awards. There are a number of um, not only applicants, but some awardees for the U.S. green chemistry uh, program uh, that are associated with the auto industry. Uh, I'll uh, talk to you a little bit about the bio-based materials workshop that we held in 2011. We're exploring a landfill, a landfill free attainment best practices um, project, which uh, is just getting underway. We're just in the concept stage. And then the other work in progress is we have ongoing discussion forums on topics of interest uh, raised by the members. So examples of green chemistry and engineering product projects in the auto sector. 
Um, I've just selected some examples that support a few of the principles of green chemistry. This is not in any means comprehensive, nor can I necessarily find examples um, where green chemistry principles have been systematically applied, but they certainly are in, um, in application uh, right now. So in preventing waste, uh, this is an example from GM. I think other companies probably have similar examples. Um, in the landfill arena since 2005, 78 of the 156 global manufacturing facilities, as well as 14 non-manufacturing operations, are landfill-free at GM. Uh, in terms of waste, since 2000, 43% decrease in waste with 91% of all waste recycled at GM. And uh, I've been encouraging GM to talk about this in a larger um, audience because I think there are lessons that they've learned that could be shared across several industry sectors. In the design of less hazardous syntheses, um, PPG has a product called Green Logic. It's a paint detackifier. Uh, that's it gets into sort of technical issues on how, what kind of paint goes on cars and how you do that. But this material uh, is a natural product and replaces petroleum-based and melamine formaldehyde products. Uh, further, PPG developed something called the Zircobon pretreatment, which is for metal pretreatment processes. Um, before you paint the car, the metal has to be really scrubbed. And there has been a solution of chrome, zinc, nickel, and manganese that's been used. And and phosphate, and the Zircobon treatment eliminates all of that. So it's reduced the sludge, it's reduced uh, the use of some of these metals, and it has been uh, quite a successful um, new, new technology. I should point out that for the green, EPA green chemistry projects, there has to be some feasibility uh, in the technology. So there has been some demonstration uh, of these technologies in use. Uh, they have to try and account for their water and energy use as well as uh, cost reduction. So some of these examples are on EPA's website. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to direct you to more information. The second uh, set of examples is the use of renewable feedstocks. And I'm going to focus on biomaterials and autos for the next several slides. Um, so with the the original equipment manufacturers, so-called OEMs, which are the big manufacturers, Ford, GM, Toyota, uh, have Tier 1 suppliers. And their Tier 1 suppliers have been really looking at biopolymers to replace existing petroleum-based resins. Um, there are bio-based resins made from corn, castor beans, sugar cane, uh, soy. And soy oil uh, has been, is very predominant across the industry for use in foams, thermoset resins, and fillers. There are fillers and reinforcements also made from soy and wood flour to reduce density of, uh, for in the products in the car or the uh, components in the car. There are natural fibers with use of uh, hemp, switchgrass, flax, wheat, straw, wood, canaf, coconut for thermosets and thermoplastics. In some cases, these are actually mixed with some petroleum products, um, but they really have reduced the extent of petroleum product use. One example of the many products on the market are the biofoam, biofoam soy seats. Uh, I haven't been able to document the extent of this, but there's certainly in over 2 million Ford vehicles on 23 platforms in the Ford line. GM's Chevy Volt and Nissan's Leaf also use soy seats, and it's probably extensively used across the industry. But there isn't, there so far has not been an inventory of these products. So with the extent of the bio-based uh, materials in the industry, um, there's something called the USDA Bio-Preferred Program, which is a labeling and preferred purchasing program for the U.S. government to encourage the use and purchase of bio-based products. This program is authorized by the 2008 Farm Bill. And if this program achieves its purpose, it's expected to decrease petroleum consumption, increase use of renewables, and better manage the carbon cycle, and it may contribute to decrease adverse environmental and health impacts. In this legislation, automobiles were designated as complex assemblies, but the autos cannot participate in this program at this time until a method for determining bio-based content has been established for such complex assemblies. This is a very different issue than trying to establish bio-based content for a simple product or for, such as clean, a cleaning product. Um, when we became aware of this program, when the committee did, um, SAE organized a workshop in 2011. And the purpose of the workshop 
really was to have a dialogue with USDA and the auto industry um, to, so that USDA could better understand what the business case already has been for establishing bio-based products, and then to discuss what the extent of the program might be with uh, this bio-preferred program. So what I'm presenting up here is the uh, business case that Faricia, um, a tier one supplier, uh, outlined at the workshop. And then I'll go on to talk a little bit about some of the issues that GM and Ford presented as examples of bio-based materials in their product lines, outlined the progress, benefits, and challenges, and in general, for bio-based materials in the autos and for the USDA program. So the, the business case that Faresia presented was reducing vehicle component weight and all overall mass reduction in the vehicle. Uh, that bio-based materials could lower emissions of greenhouse gases and other polluting gases, including volatile organics, and it could reduce the overall carbon footprint of the vehicle. Using more natural materials and reducing reliance on petroleum products if more bio-based materials were used. Um, one of the other issues is that Farisi would certainly like to continue to develop recycling initiatives and optimize recovery of production waste and increase the use of recycled materials. And I should indicate that bio, not all bio-based materials are recyclable. And that one of the other points, of course, is to enhance environmental performance based on life cycle analysis and assessment. So it became clear during the workshop that there are some elements that have to be considered that all the automotive uh, manufacturers and, and uh, tier one suppliers can consider. And that, so there, here are six of the elements that have to be considered regardless of where the materials come from. Cost is the driver. There needs to be cost effective material. It has to be priced at or lower than petroleum based products or it will not get used. Uh, the auto industry is incredibly competitive on cost. Um, consumers react to that. So this is an issue for all of us. Second part is really performance and quality as it relates to safety concern. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the talk, these products are consider, uh, considered to be in use for 15 years. So that means that the performance and quality has to be maintained for quite a long time. Uh, second issue, or third issue rather, is mass reduction. Um, how are you going to uh, minimize mass to maximize fuel efficiency, since that is a, a driver and a competitive issue? And then to reduce environmental impacts um, that really can be under the control of the auto industry from the cra cradle to gate material manufacturing. There will be global and regional availability factors for source materials that um, are quite different depending on your geographic location. And then lastly, the infrastructure for any material has got to be available so that it doesn't have to be rebuilt or invented. And that makes it uh, has to be sort of a seamless integration if there are new materials being introduced. Um, and that's going to be a particular issue, I think, to reclaim, for, to reclaim and recycle bio-based materials um, in the current structures. There's also going to be an issue of the quantity of material that has to be used. If you're trying to supply materials for the auto industry, you need a very large supply chain in general. And there are concerns against how robust the crops or plants are and what market you might be competing against uh, for use of these materials for bio-based. So those were six elements that have to be considered regardless of where the material is coming from. So part of the issue then that was identified um, in the bio-preferred program by the auto industry was uh, how will performance and safety criteria be incorporated into the program requirements if autos are to uh, be allowed to compete? How will the increased cost of measurement and validation be factored into the program? How will the business case and market for current bio-based materials in the vehicles change that there is some rapid uh, changes going on and would, would the USDA program be able to um, incorporate those changes? And as I mentioned, uh, the other issue of how will reuse or recycling of vehicle materials be balanced in concurrence with the use of bio-based materials, and what flexibility will be incorporated into the bio-based materials supply chain and feedstock um, if suddenly a, a bio-based material feedstock is no longer available, what happens next? The production, gen the production chain generally can't stop. So we will, um, those, these are issues that are under continued discussion with USDA. And um, we'll see where those go.
So the, the, as I mentioned, there are elements in a green car factor that might be ex uh, very interesting for best practices or standards for sustainability. Um, these are suggestions from, from SAE. These are not agreed to by any means. I don't want to suggest that's the case, but this is something that I think is being discussed. Um, and whether we actually get to a best practice or standard, we may get to parts of these as best practices or standards. And that's the direct fuel vehicle emissions, um, a fuel energy source and environmental impact. Uh, what are the materials? I should point out here under refrigerants, uh, there has been a new refrigerant that will go into all cars. Um, this has a tremendously different global warming potential than the current refrigerant. And it can be dropped in so that it can be used in the current uh, cars that, and the new cars so that there doesn't have to be a re-engineered um, system to, for the refrigerant and for the air conditioning. This is a huge issue. Uh, this, this issue was actually driven by some of the regulations in Europe, but it's uh, now a global, a global thing. And SAE has uh, uh, managed the cooperative research program for this alternative refrigerant, and it is now a standard. Um, U.S. government has recognized it as a standard in the Federal Register. So uh, this is how some of these issues may develop, and um, SAE would like to be able to, to play a role in assisting in those, man those issues. So the other areas in uh, the element is in the manufacturing processes and recycled and then recyclability and disposal. So these would be areas where there might be um, approaches to look for best practices or standards, and that's what we the committee is trying to do. This leads me to some of my final slides on sustainable mobility. Um, the Auto Alliance is a trade association for the U.S. Uh, based autos, and they have a very fine. Uh, small book uh, called Reinventing the Automobile, which they have put out um, They put out last year, and I think uh, there's a new one coming out. But they have defined in there, sustainable mobility means delivering safe, energy efficient products that meet our customers' needs while using the Earth's resources responsibly, minimizing environmental impacts, relying on renewable energy, and responding to different community needs for transportation, and at the same time fulfilling our fundamental role in driving world economies. It depends on collaboration with the automakers working with government, energy providers, and consumers to advance sustainable mobility through a comprehensive integrated approach. So SAE's lessons learned to date are um, at, a, at a fairly high level are the sustainability issues are cross-cutting across the company. They're not required by regulation or law. They're going to all be, so far, they're voluntary. And they're not focused in discrete technical departments in the companies as yet. Companies address sustainability very differently, but all of all auto <laughs> companies are working on it. Many have set up websites to communicate about their progress. There's no silver bullet of one or two activities. There's a wide variety of activities going on. So SAE would like to be able to continue to integrate the sustainability efforts across the auto manufacturers and suppliers, to continue to support collaboration and partnerships within the industry and encourage outreach to other industries to learn from what they've been doing. And to SAE would like to encourage the use and partnership with the Michigan Green Chemistry Network to continue to identify opportunities to advance sustainability across the industry. So conclusion is that uh, we're provide, SAE is providing the forum to the Green Technology Steering Committee to address these issues and develop a framework and strategy for global standards for environmental sustainability in the mobility sector. Much progress has been made, but there's still much that could be done and accomplished. So with that, I'll stop and um, look forward to any questions that, that the audience may have. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was really great. Um, we have one question to start off with, which is that um, can you send the attendees a presentation after this meeting? And um, I just want to remind you that the PowerPoint for this presentation will be posted at the Michigan um, Green Chemistry Clearinghouse website. And in the very near future, we have recorded this uh, presentation, and we expect to have it up on the website of the Great Lakes Green Chemistry Network at www.glgc.org, um, where you can listen to it again or download it or um, whatever you, you know, however you prefer. So we are doing our best to make these presentations 
um, available to everyone. So are there any other questions? I'm looking to see. You can type them right into the uh, little box here at the bottom if you have any questions for Carol. It's a really good opportunity. This is the first time that we have really been able to have someone from the auto industry. And I know that things are really, um, you know, moving there because there was a conference last week, the uh, Green Chemistry uh, Commerce, the Green Chemistry Commerce Council um, held its annual, seventh annual Innovators Roundtable in Ann Arbor. And there were several presentations from the auto industry which were really very um, interesting and uh, very, um, I would say, you know, it's a very hopeful situation that we're going to be really seeing some um, some progress in that area. So well, let, let me just add to that, um, uh, Lynn, in that uh, I, I think those presentations uh, that it really underscores that the individual presentations made by the individual companies demonstrate their commitment to this. They're all doing it a little differently, and. Um, it's a very competitive industry, so some of the issues are in the sustainability arena. It's a, it's actually an advantage to have some of the approaches that they do. So, trying to then come together in the industry as a consensus is, is just not going to happen on some of the products yet, um, mm -hmm. because it, the competition. I mean, we consumers are so picky, and we're very demanding. We want lots of stuff in our cars, we don't want to pay for it. <laughs> and so I think that um, those presentations, I'm not sure if they're going to be available as well, but they definitely demonstrate the commitment that the ind individual companies have made. And so that's one of the challenges SAE has, is to find some of the common grounds where uh, the industry says, yeah, yeah, I think we need a standard in this, in this regard. Um, I will say certainly some of the standards that have been put in place already uh, the refrigerant I mentioned, um, hybrid plug-ins. Um, you know, what kind of a plug are you going to have and are they all going to fit? So that's been a very big uh, standard push so that wherever you show up um, to try and plug your vehicle in, if you have an electric vehicle, it, the plug will work. Uh, in the beginning, I guess, there were several different kinds. <laughs> So those are the kinds of things that SAE is searching for. Um, happy to take suggestions from anybody who sees something that might might work, because um, it's a very active area right now. OK, we've got a lot of questions here. Um, our next question is, um, are a lot of the OEMs members of the committee at um, SAE? Uh, yes, uh, they are. We have representatives from all of the majors uh, in the U.S., including uh, Ford. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, Ford, GM, uh, Chrysler, Toyota, Hyundai. I, I will say that it depends in some cases on what the topic is, but we have access to, to the major OEMs. Great. What kinds of programs are the auto industry focusing on to help provide alternative choices for auto component chemistries? Auto component chemistries. Um, I'm not sure I can actually answer that. Uh, the, the, most, the one I'm most familiar with is what I described in the bio-based approaches. So certainly there are a number of products that have been developed. Um, soy foam cushions, headrests. There are various parts of the vehicle that have been made from bio-based materials. Uh, we have not done an inventory. That is something I wouldn't mind doing, but it is rather an extensive undertaking. I, I think at the, at the bench level, the, tier, the suppliers will be trying to look at what new materials uh, can be made, can they be efficiently made for less cost and less impact on health and the environment. Um, that's probably all very proprietary and competitive. Uh, there are some examples in the, green, the EPA Green Chemistry Award Program, uh, which you can find on EPA's Green Chemistry website. 
Uh, you go back and look at the awards and to some extent there's a good description and if they were awarded it or uh, then the chemistry will be described. Great. The next question, the next, um, the next is a comment that says there were commonalities in auto industry methods and even common to Apple's methods on green chemistry approach. Did you want to respond to that or comment on that? Um, I'm not sure I understand. You mean a Apple computer? Apparently. I'm just reading what the, uh, okay. what was. Yeah, I, I can't see. I, I'm not. Uh, Clinton, can I read? Can you take the, um, this back? Can I? Because I can't see the uh, questions. Um, well, I would assume that there are commonalities. The commonalities they might be describing is because of in, in any manufacturing process, there are going to be commonalities in the issues of where are your raw materials coming from, how are you processing them, what are you doing about your waste issues, uh, etc. So I would say th those are all issues that are going to be common. I, you know, I, and I don't know anything more than that at, at this stage. I can't. I don't think I can comment further. Sure. If the person who made that comment wants to um, expound on that, feel free to do that. In the meantime, I'll ask the next question: Are there opportunities for external review of the standards you are developing? Is there a role for NGOs in the auto sector's sustainability efforts? I think that's a very good question. Um, all the standards are reviewed, um, but they're reviewed within SAE. Uh, there's a very rigorous review process within SAE. Um, uh, there have been some, I, I would say in this, uh, there are some examples where NGOs have participated in the development of a standard, so I think it's case specific. Uh, academics are members of SAE. Uh, it isn't just uh, auto industry, it's, it's a wide variety of people. And in joining the membership, uh, you, if there's a topic that you are interested in and can find that there's been a committee or something like that, um, SAE has, has welcomed um, outside uh, interest. I will say the big difference is that SAE publishes its standards and then people have to buy the standards. So the companies buy the standards. They're not publicly available unless you purchase them. Um, that's the case for best practices as well. So that's a, a practice within SAE. If, if a standard is going to be put into a regulatory arena, then there are, there are release issues that SAE provides. But the purchase of standards and uh, publications is what, how SAE survives. So those are some of the issues that it, it isn't completely like a journal, although as a member, I can go buy any standard that I want. Now, it, it, some of them are very pricey, others are not so much. And then are, are there prohibitions, I suppose, on your sharing those with other people? Who oh, yeah, you cannot. I mean, the, the standards, you can purchase it for your own use or your company's use, but you cannot publish the standard. That's, I think one of the things that the health and environmental community may not be completely familiar with is the standard processes within standard setting organizations. This is quite routine. No, so, I, I, yeah. So for instance, if an ISO standard is published, you have to buy it. And you, it's not publicly available unless someone has paid a pretty good price to release it publicly. So those are some of the differences. I mean, it's kind of like a journal <laughs> in the sense that you have to be a member before you can have access to journal publications. And if you're not, then you have to buy the publication. Yeah, I wasn't thinking so much of, you know, re republishing it online or anything, but just whether, whether it could be shared. It's a document, right? So it could be shared with people offline is what I was thinking about. But you know, not to a huge public audience. Well, th there are rules about it, is all I can say. Huh. Okay. Um, we have another um, question. Do you have any commentary on green innovation and sustainability practices in the aftermarket arena 
or OEM's initiatives that would affect the automotive aftermarket service, that is service and repair in industry, fuel delivery, consumables, et cetera, brake pads, fluids, and so forth? Well, all I can say is that that is part of the recycling effort. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I completely appreciate the concept of aftermarket. I mean, end of life is, the end of life of the vehicle is, is definitely a driver in the industry, which is why the recycling has, has been such a, a push, although recycling has been going on in the auto industry for quite some time. Um, there are industries that have been, uh, and small businesses that have been developed I, I'm a little more familiar with the GM process than others where the companies will recycle and reclaim uh, many products from the auto at, at the end of life. So I think uh, whether it's quantitative or not, I don't know, but um, certainly there's a, a huge effort in that because it's been clear that uh, there's a cost driver here, that if you can put something to use again, uh, it, it, it can be quite cost effective. So I'm not sure if that answers the, the, the person's question, but certainly there are a lot of drivers for the end of life of the vehicle and, and how to use those materials. You know, I'm, I, I'm thinking that the, the way I'm understanding it also when they're talking about aftermarket is in um, once somebody has ownership of an automobile and whether any of this is going to filter down to the repair industry, to you know, methods of fuel delivery, consumables, brake pads, fluids, all of those things, um, are those all uh, included, I suppose, to some extent in the recycling, um, in, in your discussion of recycling, but also just in um, what's going to happen to them uh, you know, whether there's going to be any influence on those aspects. Um, oh, I, I think uh, th those would certainly be in, in the suppliers and the people to take care of things after uh, aftermarket. I, I think there's an impact. I, I don't, I, I, I'm trying to think if I have an example. Um, under the USDA program, there are some um, lubricating oils and some other individual products that have been certified under the USDA program, for instance, as bio-based. So I think it's it's moving in that direction. Um, I, I don't think, think I can answer any more specifically than that. This okay. is a vast industry, <laughs> and we have um, representatives from parts of the industry, but you know, it's a it's a finite number. And there are just huge numbers of things going on. So I think it's a credit to SAE that they've been able to identify some of the top button items. But clearly, that's what I said at the end. There, a lot has been accomplished. There is much, much more to do. Um, the next question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge for automakers to trying to manage or phase out hazardous materials? through their supply chain? Um, what functional equivalent they're going to be able to find that's going to perform uh, according to the to cost, performance, quality, safety, durability. Um, those are the things that drive consumers to purchase cars. And consumers, some consumers are not too concerned about those issues. but. There is a very large program uh, looking at hazardous materials in autos and, and what, um, how substitutions may be made or how that might work. But that's not a trivial approach by any means. So I think that, as I mentioned, and the reason I emphasized a bit the elements that have for any material that comes into the auto sector has to be considered, um, reduction in hazard, hazardous materials is, is going to follow along those lines. And if there aren't good substitutes, it's going to be a tough call. I have two related questions, so I'm going to read them both to you. Um, if standards are only available by purchase and not shareable, how are they overseen or monitored across competitive companies? And the follow-up to this is, and how does the public know 
if someone complies with a standard or practice if they don't know what the practice is? Is that a government role, a third party role? Who would, who would do that? Um, <clears throat> so there, most of the standards will have third party certification um, processes. Uh, these are companies that that's what they do. They certify against the standards. And uh, there are, I, I, I must say I'm not completely familiar with whether there are, what penalties there are, but that's what the companies have to do is certify against the standard. Um, the government can come in and look at any of these standards anytime. So I think that um, the issues of, quote, the public knowing is, is a little ill-defined and um, you know if there's specific issues or questions we can try and address that but I think there is a pretty defined process and as I mentioned in the beginning um, the auto industry is is really quite regulated by a wide variety of both federal and state agencies depending on where where they are operating um, and over globally as well so the standard setting process has been around for quite a long time. There are a wide variety of third party verifiers who have to be certified in, in a number of ways. Um, so I think that, and part of the issue is that these are really, in many cases, engineering standards. Um, if you go into a hardware store, you will find an SAE stamp on some particular uh, bolt or or product, and that it is if it has that on it, then it's certified. Now, one of the questions then is: Is somebody doing something wrong to that standard? Then the third-party certifiers have to will we'll have to look at that. I don't know if I've answered that question. I this has been something I've learned since I started working with SAE, so I am no expert on this, but I am struck by the number of of checks and balances that seem to be in place. Um, so if there are other questions or examples of that that I can follow up on later, I'd be happy to do that. Well, I'm curious as to, you know, once something is certified, what then, what ongoing oversight is there to make sure that there is, um, you know, con um, continuity in, in adherence to the standard once they've been certified? I think there's a routine monitoring that goes, you know, batches that have to be certified. I mean, it isn't just a one-off deal. I see. So this is a really expensive process. Uh huh. Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit. Can any part of the alternative refrigerant assessment development process be made public or into a case study? Um, yes. In fact, um, I think part. Of, I think it actually was. Um, I think it was DuPont, and um, DuPont was one of the, and Honeywell, I think, I'll have to think about this. I think it should be on the EPA web, website because they did apply. They did not win, but they did apply um, as uh, for a, an EPA Green Chemistry Award. And I think that is on the website. Uh, there may be another publication because this was, this was a huge deal. Um, to have not only gotten uh, a, a pretty simple olefin um, refrigerant that could be dropped in, because uh, otherwise it was going to be, a, it, the industry was not clear how they were going to meet the requirements. So I, I think it should be there. If not, uh, you can um, get in touch with me and I can see what other information. But I, I, it should be an example, and I think it's two years ago. It didn't win, so you'd have to just look at the applications all of which are on the EPA website. Um, OK, let's see. I have a, uh, an answer that says, yes, it is DuPont and Honeywell for the alternative refrigerant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that seems to be the end of the questions. Um, we do have time for a few more. If somebody wants to squeeze something else in, we can do that. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank Carol again for a great webinar. Really, you know, a lot of questions, and um, uh, I think that, you know, it's been really uh, 
very interesting in an area that we haven't really um, necessarily always, uh, you know, been able to present in the past. Um, well, I, I appreciate that, Lynn. I really, I think one of the things I've found is that there's an, a really an amazing amount of work going on in the industry in the sense of reducing the environmental footprint, reducing the carbon footprint, and the industry is not so good at talking about it. Um, they do in their own conferences, but I think these are cross-cutting issues that are becoming more important across many, uh, across the public and many other sectors. So I really appreciated and SAE appreciated the invitation to speak to a very different audience about this. Um, my view is that it, it's going to enrich the program to have others thinking about it and to try and you know continue to drive the performance and improvement. So I, in some ways, I'm a cheerleader for this program. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I need to obviously go back and learn a little bit more about the standardization process. But uh, this, is, this has been a very, uh, the process has been a very effective one for the autos um, to date. I, you know, just speaking personally, I think that um, for some of us, it's this kind of, you know, shadowy, I'm not saying that it is, I'm just saying that the perception sometimes is that there's, you know, there are these standards which are being promulgated um, for industry by industry. And it, it, it often seems like there's not a lot of opportunity for public oversight. Um, which can work to their advantage, but also to their disadvantage, as you say, because people are not really aware of the efforts that may be made, being made that are reflected in the standards. Mm -hmm. So I, that's where a lot of the questions come from, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that back to, to the committee uh, for some discussion. I, I think one of the things that's really hard is that the industry went through, as we're all aware, incredible shrinkage. So having um, staff able to have some of these outreach efforts, if it doesn't directly go to the bottom line, is extremely hard. Um, you know, so I, I mean, the economies and the cost issues are, are the drivers mm -hmm. uh, continually. And it, it makes it very hard to, I mean, in the number of people who retired and left the industry, you know, they're, you can look at the numbers. The number of people employed in the industry is down tremendously. Yeah. So I, I, that's not necessarily an excuse, but it, it means that trying to find the right people in the various companies that might be able to help have this outreach is very tough. So the representatives that showed up at the conference last week, um, that was terrific. Uh, doesn't happen very often. Uh, we're trying to encourage more of it. And you know the Green Technology Steering Committee uh, circulated that information, tried to help a little bit um, with broadcasting this, and then trying to figure out which companies might be able to to make those presentations. So it it is a it's that's one of the big challenges uh, continually here. <laughs>